I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Wow, what a day today. Things were tense in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as the jury continued their deliberations, things happening inside the courtroom, outside the courthouse. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But we need to begin tonight in Brunswick, Georgia, the shooting death of Ahmad Arbery. The man who shot and killed him took the stand in his own defense. Shouldn't be surprising. It's a self-defense case, much like what we're seeing in Kenosha, with a huge, huge difference. And I want to point that out to you. The difference between the self-defense being alleged in Brunswick, Georgia, and the self-defense being alleged in Kenosha. And it really comes down to the circumstances surrounding the two shootings. And who is pursuing who? And who is initiating the physical confrontation? That's the difference in these two trials. We've gone through what's been happening out in Kenosha. You've seen the videos of Kyle Rittenhouse being chased. Completely different scenario in Brunswick, Georgia. The one thing that has been clear from the beginning is that Ahmad Arbery was being pursued. He's on foot, and there are three men in two pickup trucks on video who were tracking and chasing him. And that makes this case completely different and, a, and a, an extra obstacle for the defense down in Brunswick, Georgia. Because not only do they need to somehow justify the shooting of Ahmad Arbery in front of this jury, they've got to justify the chase as well. That's the difference. Why are you pursuing Ahmad Arbery? And then when you are face to face with Ahmad Arbery, why are you shooting and killing him? That's the extra challenge that the defense has. That's why it's different than what's happening in Kenosha. And today, Travis McMichael, the man who had the shotgun in his hand, testified in his own defense and told his story to the jury about what happened that day. Take a listen. I was in the living room. Uh, I was trying to get my son to take a nap. Did your dad come in? He did. All right. What did you notice about your dad when he came in? Uh, he came through the kitchen, the back kitchen door that leads to the garage, and uh, he was in a almost frantic state. He ran off. I think he told me to grab my gun. Okay. He, you know, he said, something's happening, grab your gun. <clears throat> Have a dad saying the guy that just ran by the house, the guy that you, that been breaking into, into the house down the road, just ran by the house, I came out, didn't see him, and then saw Matt Albenzi, who was on scene on February 11th, who also saw the video and has been seen, has seen videos as we've talked about, sure. pointing down the road. I thought it was reasonable that, okay, there's something to this. I just started driving. At that point, Which I don't way think are you driving. I, I turn out and head towards Burford. So I come up to him, pull up <laughs> alongside of him. Okay. Uh, that moment, I recognize it is him. It is the same guy that I saw from the left. I uh, asked him, said, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Are you yelling? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. So we finally stopped, asked what's going on. He never says anything to me. He still look at me angry. I'm thinking, man, man this guy's, yeah, this could be volatile. You know, let's, let's be kind of watching here. I ask him again, hey, what is what happened down the road? Why are people pointing down the road? You know, where are you running from? He didn't say anything, and he's still kind of in the same spot he is. He's not um, he's not squaring up or anything like that. He's just standing there. And then I said, hey, the police are on the way. As soon as I said the police, he turned and ran straight back down Burford towards Holmes. About that time, Dad was getting out of the vehicle, uh, obviously to get out of the car seat, and started clamoring into the climbing to the back of the pickup truck. Okay, what did you do? Watching Dad. And then I realized... What do you mean watching Dad? Watching him try to get him in the back of the truck. Oh, okay. Uh, and then I realized that my shotgun was down on the floorboard. Uh, Mr. Arbery is running away. I take the gun out and put it back into my into my uh, seat, put it wedge back on. I look down from all that, look up, and then there is a black Chevy pickup, or black pickup at the time I thought 
but uh, he was with the vehicle, and they were coming into my lane. All right. Are you at all wondering why Mr. Aubrey is not going somewhere other than this vehicle? That was my first thought. This guy's obviously, something's not right. He seems dangerous to me. He's trying to get in this vehicle. Um, I'm still under pressure. The police are coming. I could see down to my house. I could see down to this dog leg. I can see Burford, and I can see the rest of Tilla. This is a good chunk of the neighborhood, and I know where he just left from. I decided to stay right there where I was at. I don't know if Dad yelled or, or if I was looking down the road, but I look down the road, and I see Mr. Arby running back towards me. I get to the front of the truck, and by the time I get to the front of the truck, he is at the front corner panel on the right-hand side, and he turns and is on me in it's on me. I mean, in a flash. I mean, it's immediately on me. On you doing what? He grabs the shotgun, and I believe I was struck. Um, what were you thinking at that moment? I was thinking of my son. It, it sounds weird, but that was the first. This is the first thing that hit me. What did you do? I shot. Why? He he had my gun. He, he struck me. It was obvious that he was, uh, it was obvious that, that he was attacking me, that if he would have got the shotgun from me, then it was, uh, this is a life or death situation. That, sec that third shot, which I thought was second, that, that final shot, he disengaged. And at that point, he let go. He turned and continued to run down, um, down to the And at that point, I was in shock. Let me bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who's live in Brunswick tonight, because I have some questions here. This isn't the first time we've heard from him because we've seen the body camera uh, footage. We've read some of the police reports as well. Let me, before we get into the reaction in the courtroom, everything else, his story. Was it the same story that he told on the body cam footage? Was it the same story he told police in their police report? Was there anything new in what he said today? He definitely filled in holes that we didn't know from him, uh, from what we know on the body camera. I don't think he contradicted anything that we heard from him on the body camera footage, and we don't have the actual video of the police interviews. That didn't completely come into evidence. This jury has only heard bits and pieces of that body camera footage. But the way that he explained exactly uh, what was happening when Ahmad Arbery was running towards him, what we've all seen in that incident video, that I think think was very new from anything that has happened in this trial before and what we have seen and heard in uh, the body camera footage and any police interviews that we know about him saying that he raised that gun because he thought that Ahmad Arbery was going to come at him and his father and that he was trying to deter him to run away when he raised the gun and then he talked about that hidden exchange in front of the truck that we can't see because the video went down but then he he looked a lot different than he did in that body camera footage and he uses different words today he was using words like reasonable state of mind totality of the circumstances none of that police speak lawyer speak was used when he was describing things in the moment on that body camera footage you know the, the two questions you know why he shot him i think we heard that was it clear from his explanation as to why he is following him to begin with it is clear uh, as far as what's in his mind. He said that this is the person that he was already concerned about who had been breaking into this home. Uh, the defense did a really good job of showing the buildup, talking about him first being concerned about this rise in crime, the Facebook posts on the neighborhood page, the fact that his own gun had been stolen in January, two months beforehand, and then that encounter with Ahmad Arbery 12 days before the incident. He talked about how nervous he was and thought that this guy, at the time he didn't know it was Arbery, was very bold in the way that he stayed inside of that Satilla Shores home, even while he was looking at him and trying to figure out who he was. Uh, so that encounter seemed to still be in his mind when he was chasing him, is what he testified to on the stand today. 
Did he talk about any interaction, any conversation with Ahmad Arbery during the course of this five-minute chase? He did, and that was newer information than we've had before. We knew that he had yelled at him, said he wanted him to stop and wanted to talk to him, but he got very descriptive today. He talked about multiple times that he tried to interact with Ahmaud Arbery. He said he drove up next to him and just said, hey, what are you doing? Please, we want to talk to you. He emphasized it. He said the word please to him, and he said that he made eye contact with Arbery, especially the first time that he got next to him, but he said that Arbery never said anything back to him, and he described his face as looking angry, mad, having clenched teeth. And he said the second time that he got next to him, and he said Arbery actually stopped, and that they had a moment of communication, but that there was no communication coming back from Arbery, and that when he said the words, the police are on the way, that Arbery took off running. All right, Julie Janae, stand by. Let's bring in our think tank, get some reaction to this direct testimony. Travis McMichael telling his story. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy. In Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. And in Phoenix, Arizona, former criminal defense attorney, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series, Trapped with Ms. Arias, Kirk Nurmi, is with us. Okay, here's my question, and I'll throw it out to, to everyone. What is, is more significant from this direct examination, what he is actually saying or how he is saying it. Eklund. Um, he wasn't saying anything much. I'm sorry. I didn't see anything that he said that helped. The only thing that he kept saying, he was in fear. And the only thing to be in fear of was Ahmad Arbery's skin. That he did nothing but sit, like essentially say that he was a racist without actually saying he was a racist. The only thing that he can say was that it was a black man that accosted him. Like he, he approached a black man. And my thing is that there was no duty for uh, uh, Mr. Aubrey to stop. He is not a police officer. He's not a law enforcement. There's no duty for a free man to have to, to, to stop. And that's that's what I got from the testimony is that how dare Mr. Arbery not stop and talk to me when I have a shotgun in my hand. That's what I got. Nima Romani. Vinny. Yeah, it's how he said it, what he said, how he looks. He's trying to tailor his testimony for this jury. It wasn't really effective, but let's go through what he said. He said that he had my gun. It was obvious he was attacking me. It was a life or death situation. Well, no, you put yourself in that situation. And, you know, Julia talked about him saying, please stop. Well, that's not what you and your dad told law enforcement initially. You said, hey, stop. Or I'm going to blow your expletive head off. Very different. Travis, look at him right now. He's got the beard. He's got the shaved head. He trims the beard. Now he's growing his hair out. He's trying to paint a very completely non racist non-aggressive version of himself for the jury, and they're not going to buy it. This Lee's version of Travis is completely inconsistent with the expletive version on that body cam, and I think the jury is going to see right through it. Kirk Nurmi, you know a few things about defendants when they take the witness stand and then how, how that goes. Um, your thoughts about Travis McMichael taking the stand today, how he testified, and the words that he used. Yeah, I think what Neiman Eklund said is spot on, but one thing that struck me, and I, it was kept happening over and over again, is the language that he used. Like Julia said, this very legalistic language. They've been trying through this whole trial to kind of cast these men as law enforcement officers and playing off what Anima said, you know, he's got this language, he's saying expletives, everything else. He's on the stand, he's citing federal statutes. He's talking about his training. He's talking about de-escalation techniques. It all seemed very canned and rehearsed, and I think the jury is going to see right through that that image that he's trying to portray as, as uh, you know, being a law enforcement type person doing law enforcement type work. Nima, let me ask you, tonight, what are prosecutors doing? It, it, it seemed like they were um, kind of in the, in the delay mode, kind of a slow roll of the cross-examination until the end of the day. Um, what are they doing tonight to get ready for tomorrow morning? 
Well, yeah, they did delay because this cross-examination is going to be everything. I mean, the conventional wisdom in these cases, self-defense, is that the defendant has to testify. Well, you know, Rittenhouse, we were surprised because the defense was so far ahead. And in this particular case, I think Travis had to testify. But again, the body cam speaks for itself. The video, Roddy Bryan, speaks for himself. And Travis, frankly, isn't a good witness. So, Vinny, what prosecutors are doing tonight, now that they delayed a bit, is doing a happy dance out there in Georgia, because this was a terrible witness on direct. And, you know, obviously, it's, the case is a little tougher against Greg and even tougher against Roddy Bryan. I think they're all guilty. But as far as Travis is concerned, he was atrocious today, and he's going to get destroyed tomorrow morning when the cross-examination resumes. All right, when we come back, we're going to show you a little bit of the uh, beginning of the cross-examination, which actually started today. But like I said, it was sort of a slow rollout. I'm expecting big things tomorrow morning. We'll be right back.